Hey, we're doing great songs on God's playlist, and what I'm doing is just taking a selection of different psalms uh, out of the book of uh, Psalms, and uh, we're, we're focusing on them. And today I, I want to talk about uh, Psalm 19. And Psalm 19, uh, I want to talk about hearing with our eyes. Now, most of you do your hearing with your ears. But hearing with your eyes is so important. In fact, for the first four months of a, a, an infant's life, the eyes focus on the face of whoever is speaking, and they've monitored the location of where the eyes focus. And in those first four months, you see all those spots on there? Monitoring the focus of the parent or the person that is speaking, they focus on the eyes. For about the first four, six months, depending on the child's maturity and the rate in which they mature, their focus is on your eye. It's eye to eye. But something unusual happens by the eighth month. The focus has shifted down to the mouth. Now, experts in language, experts in language tell us <clears throat> that it's around four months to a year that the language skills begin to be acquired. And so the child is learning to speak by watching your mouth. Did you ever do that? Read the lips? Huh? Read the lips? Every now and then we'll get a phone call and we'll put the TV on silent mode. And you watch and you can still figure out what they're saying on the screen, if you're not one on the phone, by just watching the lips move. Now the jury is out. We don't know how masks are going to affect these kids who have been wearing, with the adults all wearing masks, and not being able to focus on their mouths if that will cause speech impediments. But we know for years to come, they're going to be studying this generation of children to see the impact of wearing a mask while children are trying to figure out how to speak. You see, they hear as much with their eyes as they do with their ears. I want to suggest to you that King David, he saw the sky talk. All right? He saw the sky talk. And he sang about it. Psalm 19. He says, this song is for the director of music. And he says, the, the, the writer of the psalm is David. Inspired by God, he says these words, the sky talk is glorious. What you see in the sky is glorious. Listen, Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The Hebrew word for glory is kavod. And that word actually means heavy. <laughs> it's heavy. It's weighty. I've been putting on a little glory myself. <laughs> I'd like to shed some of this glory, if you know what I mean. But the idea is it's weighty, heavy, it's majestic. Uh, we have an expression that, man, that was a heavy thought. What do you mean? Really profound. And, and that's the whole idea. That they say that the heavens declare the, heaven, the, the heaviness, the majesty, the splendor of God. Everywhere I look, I see it. Every now and then when I'm driving on, on a Sunday morning, it's that time of year that the sun is just painting the whole sky. The whole sky. And it just looks so beautiful, and I just say, oh my goodness, God, you painted that for me. Because he could have just left it blue, right? He could have just left it blue. The sky talk that we get from looking into all of creation is glorious. It reflects God's glory. The skies proclaim the work of his handiwork. It's a natural thing. It's in all of nature. The skies are proclaiming that this is God's handiwork. I look up into the sky and I say, God made that. God created that. That just didn't happen by accident. Now just think about this. The scientific theory is called the Big Bang. The Big Bang. And the Big Bang is basically saying, miraculous. 
Everything that is came out of nothing. Now, you've got to realize that even space, although people think that there's nothing in space, space is something because there is space between Earth and the moon and the sun, so space is distance. Distance is something. So it, to, to be nothing, you've you got to have absolutely not even space. And there was a bang out of sheer nothingness. Listen to me. The evolutionist, the one who believes in the Big Bang, has more faith than you do because he thinks everything came out of nothing. And we teach that God is eternal, always was. And he created everything. And in him we live, move, and have our being. And listen to this. The skies proclaim it's all his handiwork. He's behind it. He's behind it. The sky talks. The sky talks. Next verse. Day after day, they pour forth their speech. Every day, night after night, displays the knowledge. It is constantly out there. It is so much there that we take it for granted. Then I go to the refrigerator and I open the door and I look and I can't find what I'm looking for. I close the door. And my wife comes along, she opens the door, and it's right there. She picks it right up and hands it to me. <laughs> my goodness. Day after day, all of creation is talking to you, to your eyes, about God. And what do we do? We take it for granted. We don't, seeing it, we don't see it. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's constant. Listen. The sky talk, God speaking, and all of creation is universal. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. There's a few universal sounds that everyone recognizes. Listen, when a person is laughing, no matter what language you're in, you know they're, they're laughing. You know, you know what it is. Something was obviously funny or tickled them in an unusual way. <clears throat> crying, crying is the same way. It's universal. Every language. Listen, God is saying that like laughing and crying, <clears throat> the whole universe is speaking that God is and he is glorious, and everything that is was created by him. <clears throat> He's speaking all of that, and everyone, everywhere, it's in a language they can understand. Nobody misses this. Nobody misses this. Let's go a little bit further. Sky talk is everywhere. <clears throat> Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Did you notice that? The voice of creation is bombarding us. The words, the words of creation are bombarding us. They are everywhere. You cannot escape God's message. It is so thorough that it is in every planet, constellation, star, Whatever is out there, moon, you, you, it's everywhere. But if you were to take a microscope and, and, and you were to look and look at a cell, every little cell in this universe is stamped with, created by God, the glorious one. You look within yourself, according to Romans chapter 2, even my conscience is bearing witness of right and wrong because I have... The message of God everywhere. It's inescapable. It's inescapable. It's everywhere. Talking about being everywhere, he says, their voice goes out to all the earth, their words to the ends of the earth. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun. I didn't know how to illustrate this, so I found a tent. <laughs> and he's pitched, the heavens are supposed to be, all the whole universe is supposed to be, that's the tent. And so the sun gets to go into the tent. It's, it, it's out in space, okay? He says, the, it's pitched its tent for the sun. What has the sky, the, the heavens, the heavens. And, and so then he says this, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion. <laughs> I don't know if you caught that, but I had a bridegroom go, oh, 
and it's like a champion rejoicing on the, running his course. And, and so what we have here is, he's saying, he's comparing it to something here on earth. The runner runs, the bridegroom comes out. He's saying, every day the sun comes up in all of its glory. It, it, it's coming out like the glory uh, of the groom to meet the bride. And then it's coming out like the runner who's going to run his, his course. And, and then he goes on and he adds this. It rises at one end of the heaven and it makes its circuit to the other end. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is hidden from its heat. It comes up every day and it goes down. Now you say, well, wait a minute. We have a little problem here because we know the sun doesn't come up and go down. That is a figure of speech, just as it is today in the scientific community. Every day, scientists tell me, sunrise will be at 640, and sunset will be at 820. Give me the numbers, OK? They're doing the same thing. They're saying, we know it's the Earth that is moving and rotating. But the expression, the idiom that we use is sunrise, sunset. He's saying here, listen, the sun then goes over its course. We, we see it arising in the east, and it makes its course across, and it sets in the west. And, and then the next day, it does the same thing. It's in its circuits. It is so predictable, I can count on this, that tomorrow, God is going to speak to you through his creation. God's going to speak to you through creation. Last night, I went to uh, my niece's presentation of her ministry uh, in Albania at her home church. And so they gave her more time than I gave you last week. I gave her 10 minutes here. She had like a full hour. So I got the full, full dose last night. And what blew me away, because I have this message in my mind, it's Saturday, I'm mulling it over for Sunday, is that she said <clears throat> when she was in Albania, and, and she had to slide up, and she was crossing this lake in a boat. And uh, the mountains, you can see in the distance. And she said, it was then from that setting, seeing all this, that God spoke to her heart and said, Albania is the place for you to minister. I wonder how often God is speaking to us through his creation, but we just are not listening. Now imagine what more we would get if we were really listening to what he is saying in creation. It is predictable, it's there every day. Well, what exactly does the sky say? All right, what exactly does the sky say? I think we have to go to the New Testament for this, and I don't have these points in your bulletin, so if you're taking notes, you're going to have to find some spare spot to put these down. But in Romans chapter 1, it speaks about the wrath of God. Listen to this. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. God's wrath is revealed from heaven. I'm always amazed when a catastrophe hits like a tsunami or a terrible tornado, like the one that went through Kentucky. When that happens, even the unbelievers say it was an act of God. Isn't that right? Even the people on the news. Even the insurance company says, oh, we don't, we don't cover acts of God. <laughs> See, they acknowledge that God, God is a God of holiness, righteousness, judgment, and wrath upon the wicked. Oh my, listen. It is only of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Oh my goodness. The wrath of God is being revealed uh, from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Wicked, the, the wicked are judged. Sometimes God intrudes in time and space and judges the person, and other times he allows it to go to the end time judgment. But judgment is coming. He says here, since what may be known about God is plain to them. Everybody knows God. Because you know you're a creature of someone. And it is God who created you to whom you are accountable 
He says, says, what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. When you look into the sky and you see this, this natural wonder of creation, it is declaring to you it is God's handiwork and you are God's creature who is accountable to him. Wow. It reveals that this God is a God of wrath and judgment. Holiness. Second thing that it it does in Romans chapter 1. It says what the attributes of God are. At least a couple. He's the creator. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, I can't see these qualities, His eternal power and His divine nature have been clearly seen. You can't mistake him. Notice it's God's, the true and living God, the creator God. He's got two attributes here that he says his eternal power, you know it took power to make all that is. Second thing it declares that God is a creator, that there is a divine nature, that God is a personal being who actually created this whole thing. And he says they have been clearly seen and being understood by the things that are made. You know what he's saying? (laughs) God's handiwork is got made by Jehovah God stamped on every single atom in the universe. (laughs) It is clearly seen so that men are without excuse. No one will be able to say, but I didn't know you, Lord. He's going to say, oh, yes, you did. I left you a witness in all of creation, and you were without excuse, and you deserve my wrath because it was clearly seen, it was plain, and you just would not acknowledge it to be so. Wow. Third thing. We've already touched on this one from Psalm 19. It declares the glory of God. For although they knew God, notice that, He's talking about people who actually knew God. How did they know him? Through the whole clear witness of of this creation. They knew God, neither they neither glorified him as God nor gave him thanks. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. They allowed their sin nature to dictate to them a darkness that excluded God. Although they claim to be wise, their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And although they claim to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of God, of the immortal God, for images made to look like mortal man, birds and animals and reptiles. So I got an Egyptian God up there. <laughs> and exactly what they did. God's saying, you knew who I was. My whole creation is, is telling you who I am. And yet you created for yourself something made in your own image, an animal image. And, and most of the time we think of this as idolatry. But think for a moment. Our whole evolutionary educational process is telling people, you came from an animal. Instead of the hand of God. You happened randomly out of nothing, which was a miraculous event. You just won't credit God. It was a big bang. It's declaring the glory of God. God is glorious and they won't acknowledge it. It also reveals the justice of God, which goes back to the wrath of God. Therefore, God gave them over. God just justly said, I'm done with you. That's what you want. That's what you can have. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And they exchanged the glory, and they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is forever praised. Listen. Every day, people wake up, they look out at creation. And God is screaming out to them who he is by what he has made, and you should know it. It's not written words. It's visual words. So I was driving on the way to church here today, and I saw 
Ah, there's my illustration. It was a yellow sign, rectangular, kind of in a diamond shape, and it had a little arrow on it, curved. There was not a single word on it. But it told me that somebody posted that sign there so that I would know to turn up ahead, otherwise I'd wind up in the lake. All right? So it was screaming at me, don't go straight, turn left. And so that's what I did. I followed the instruction of the sign. All creation. God is stamped everywhere. He's the creator. He's the divine being behind it. Listen, if you don't follow me, you're headed to wrath and judgment. Turn, turn, repent. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Wow. And then I noticed this in the book of Acts. All of creation is also communicating to us the kindness of God. It's the wrath of God and the kindness of God. Apostle Paul preaching said, yet he has not left himself without testimony. <laughs> Here, God's testifying to this. He has shown kindness by giving you rain, the rain that falls. <laughs> the rain that is falling is the kindness of God, which makes that wrath of God all the more. He's being so kind to you, and you won't acknowledge that it's coming from him. You see what's going on here? The signs are everywhere speaking. Listen, he says, he's shown you kindness. Theologians call this common grace. Common grace. He makes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. But a day is coming when he's going to separate the wheat from the tares. He's going to remove the unjust from the just. Judgment day is coming. The wrath of God everywhere screaming at us. And he's saying, listen, I'm being so kind to you. Repent. He's been kind to you, giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season, providing you with plenty of food to fill your hearts with joy. God has been so good to you when you don't deserve it, and, and this is going on. Why do people deny it? Why do they thumb, put their, their thumb over it and just say, no, no, no? Why, why, why do they do that? Why do they deny it? Romans 1.18 tells us, the wrath of God is being revealed from the heavens against the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress. The Greek word is to hold down. They push down the truth. See, the truth is I'm a sinner, but I don't want to be a sinner, so I just push that down. The truth is I'm going to give an account to God, but I don't want to give an account. I want, to be, I want God to give an account to me. So I'm going to say things like, a good God would never judge anyone. Well, he can't be good if he won't judge evil. He's just not good. But they, they suppress, they push that down, they push that down. And this passage is saying, listen, people deny it because they're lost in their sin. When, when Adam fell in the garden, we got a sinful nature, and that sinful nature will always deny what it sees everywhere in creation. Wow. Creation through the kindness and the wrath of God, really only bring condemnation. It does not bring salvation. And so that's why the Apostle Paul, before he wrote that passage in Romans 1.18 and following, he said in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. <laughs> what is the gospel? He tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ died for our sins and was buried according to the scriptures, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel is that if you have Jesus Christ who died for your sins, was buried for your sin, and risen from your sins, you'll get a new nature, and all of a sudden, aha, everything in this universe speaks to you of God. Wow. You can't be changed from the inside out. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to salvation. Sky talk only condemns you. The gospel message is what saves you. That's why we send missionaries. That's why we have to share our faith. No one ever gets saved by looking at creation. They only come away guilty and suppressing the truth because they don't like to feel guilty. When we give them the message that Jesus Christ takes our sin away and he gives you life so you can see clearly, that is the good news. 
Salvation of everyone who believes. They must believe. Must believe. He says, my audience is first the Jews, because he's Jewish. Salvation came unto the Jews, his own people, and then to the Gentiles, the rest of the world. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. It starts with faith, it ends with faith. I have to believe to have my eyes opened. You see, sky talk is scriptural. The first part of Psalm 19, as we return to Psalm 19 now, the first part of Psalm 19 uh, is that sky talk is out in, out in nature. It's natural. It's in the heavens. Now he says the same God of the heavens who's declaring all, all his glory there is the God who now has spoken through his prophets and incorporated that message into scriptures where you can read it. And you still hear with your eyes as you read the words on the page. You read what you're hearing with your eyes. You're hearing with your eyes. Scriptural sky talk says this. It is life altering. It's life changing. He moves from all of nature. He says, now, the law of the Lord, the Torah, the instruction of the Lord, that's basic meaning of law, instruction of the Lord is perfect. There is nothing wrong with any of God's revelation. The problem is with us. We don't want to accept what he is telling us. But he says the law of the Lord is perfect and it's reviving the soul. It's making it completely different. It's altering it. It's changing it. The statutes of the Lord, another synonym for the law of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, perfect, trustworthy. As the one is reviving the soul, the other is making you wise. The light comes on and you see clearly. The difference between a person who doesn't know Christ and a person who knows Christ is when they read the Bible, the person who doesn't know Christ, they see it as just any other book. They get nothing out of it. But when you know Christ, you read the Bible and you hear God speak to you. The difference between the person who doesn't know Christ in all of God's natural creation, the sky talk, they don't, they don't hear a thing. Why? They got their ears plugged on purpose. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, the God of this age, Satan has blinded their eyes. They, they can't see it. What does come through, they're suppressing it, pushing it down. But what, what happens? All of that is gone. You see clearly. You see that magnificent sunset and you say, oh my goodness, God, you are awesome. You are awesome. It's life changing. Scriptural sky talk. The same God that talks in the sky, talks in the scriptures. That talk that he gives in the word is enlightening. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy. It enlightens my emotions so I have joy. It gives joy to my heart. And the commandments, another synonym, all of these laws, precepts, commandments, instruction. He says, the commandments of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Now I can see. I was once blind, but now I see. How? The word of God took seed in my heart. I was born again, and I now have eyes to see the truth. And I see all the glory of God. Wow. It's enlightening. Sky talk from the word of God is enduring, for the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The Bible is forever settled. It's forever settled. The ordinance of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. You can count on your, the Word of God, your Bible. Scriptural t- uh, sky talk, when God speaks, and He speaks through the, the same God of the sky, speaks through the Scriptures, He says it's valuable These words are more precious than gold. Your Bible is more valuable than your IRA, your pension. (laughs) Your Bible, the Word of God, which gives eternal life, is more valuable, much more than pure gold. They are sweeter than honey and than the honey, than from the honeycomb. He says, listen, When you know Jesus, this is what is most valuable in your life. 
He makes a final shift in the last couple of verses of this song that he's singing. Sky talk becomes personal. It's alarming. The personal sky talk is alarming. He says, by them your servant is warned. He's warned. All creation is warning the wrath of God. It's warning about the kindness of God. Why would you reject the kindness of God and put yourself in the wrath of God? I read the scriptures. The scriptures say that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ our, Jesus Christ our Lord. He that has not the Son does not have life, but he that has the Son has life. These are all warnings. You need Jesus. That's the message. You're getting warned. You're getting warned, he says. And keeping them is great reward. <laughs> He that has the Son has life. What greater reward can you have than that? Eternal life. Forgiveness of your sin, pardon. A standing with God. Oh my goodness, there's so many. It's also convicting. It's also convicting. Who can discern his error? The Bible looks into my life. It's like a mirror and I see myself. And as I look into the perfect law of liberty, I see what manner of man I am and it becomes uncomfortable. But I see what I need to confess and I see what I need to change. As I look into the word, it makes me convicted deep down inside that I need change. But this personal sky talk is where I find forgiveness. Forgive my hidden faults. Oh, he's exposed them through the word. And now I confess my sin and he's faithful and just to forgive me. Keep your servant also from willful sins. Change my life, oh God. Change my heart. Change my life. May they not rule over me. I don't want them to be the controlling factor. I don't want to have a ball and chain to a sin and be dragging that around and then having it pull me where it wants to go. He said, then will I be blameless, innocent, and great, <clears throat> innocent of great transgressions. When I am in the Word, and the Word is in me, my life will be changed. I picked up a Bible one day, and I opened the front leaf of it and said, this book will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from this book. I thought that was pretty cool. It's true. When I get into the Word and I allow the Word to get into me, I then begin to live differently. It changes my life. It keeps me from sin. And then when I sin, I feel guilty, so I don't want to get into the book. Yeah. Personal sky talk is pleasing. May the words of my mouth, and then he talks about, And the meditations of my heart, what I've got memorized, what I'm thinking about. If I memorize the word of God, okay, and I'm I'm working around Psalm 1 or, you know, Zephaniah 317 or 2 Corinthians, you know. When I'm working on those verses, he says, may the word of my mouth, meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. It pleases God. Oh, Lord, my rock, my redeemer. All right, today we've worked our way through Psalm 19. And so what is it that we should take with us today? What should we take with us? I want you to take this. God has and is speaking to you today. God is speaking to you today. Are you listening? Are you listening? Are you hearing all you got to do is open your eyes. <laughs> All you got to do is open your eyes. And he'll open your ears. Let's pray. Father in heaven, open our eyes. Open them, Lord. That we might see the majesty, the splendor, the glory of our God in all of creation. And Lord, as we open up our Bibles, to see the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May it alter and change us from within that we would be a people of God doing the will of God all for the glory of God. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen.